So right now we're embarking on a process of intentional growth. And we're just looking at what the process of creating a long-term plan should even look like for us. Um, and we want to be sure uh, that the process is part of the product. So our ends and values need to be expressed not only in the outcomes, but also the process. Um, we are a collective management, um, and which means that we don't have a general manager. We have 30 people on our management team. Um, and uh, the management team uses consensus, just like our board. Um, so to me, good process on the management and on the board looks like this. So I pulled this from the ICA's blueprint. I, I thought it expressed well what it would feel like to be part of a good process and to, be, to feel like you belong. Um, the goal is for participants to feel like they're a valuable piece of the puzzle and that they are personally called to contribute. So that's pretty deep level. Um, and of course, when, you know, when I'm talking with the rest of my managers about policy or a, process or, a, or a new program or something like that, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of relationship building. Um, and um, importantly, the proposal changes as it goes along. So that's something else that happens when you see this. It changes according to who's involved. Um, so it sounds pretty hunky-dory, right? At People's Food Co-op, we do this all the time. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> of course, uh, despite our best efforts, there's always people who don't feel heard, or people that other people notice might not be as engaged as they could be. Um, so we started asking ourselves questions, and we started asking ourselves if there might be some deeper issue, is, issues involved. Excuse me. Um, so for the last few years, um, the management has been studying anti-oppression principles in earnest and really thinking about how um, we have each internalized social oppressions, societal oppressions, excuse me, and then played them out at work. You can't help it. We grow up in this culture. We grow up um, around other people. These effects are going to happen and we're going to do them. So we can't help how we were raised. We can only take responsibility moving forward. And that's what we're trying to do. And of course, we're using these principles to look at our process and to think about how we want to grow. And the big questions that come up for us is, um, who feels like they belong at our co-op? What do they look like? Um, we have a few ends that apply. There's some pieces of this statement that apply directly. Human rights, social and economic justice, safe, welcoming community where all are valued and access to healthful foods our customers can trust. So who is actually accessing our co-op? Um, and how does that compare to our neighborhood? And uh, we used member owner surveys and compared them to 2010 census data. And um, what I found was that Peoples is, has a higher percentage of people who identify as white than the neighborhood. And uh, our one, one age bracket, about 10 years younger, uh, people come to peoples as compared to the neighborhood. Um, so it's pretty interesting. And our, our people, like, like a lot of co-ops, uh, most of the people who are owners are white. They're middle class, and they're very well educated. Um, so uh, figuring out who, who's actually accessing the co-op and what their barriers might be. Um, I think in relation to all that census data and stuff, we're the most comfortable in places where people look like us. So that's really something that we're trying to consider and look at. Um, cost, of course, as we're all familiar, um, cost can be an issue for a lot of people, whether it's just the perception of higher prices or whether it's actual higher prices. Um, so we're trying to figure out how we're going to uh, combat some of these effects with our growth process. And I've seen some cool examples out there, and I have some cool ideas, and I'm always open to hearing more cool ideas from people. Um, and I'd love to know how it works out at your co-op. Um, but we might go to the African Immigrant Community Center in our neighborhood and just walk there, say hi, just start a conversation. We might talk to uh, the farmers who bring us food for whom English is not a first language. 
and speak to them in their native language and ask them, how can we build our relationship with you and your partners and your workers? Um, Olympia Food Co-op did a really cool thing. Um, they started their visioning process by having a meeting um, and only marginalized people from basically people who weren't white were invited <laughs> to the meeting. That's how they started their process. So cool. Mariposa has had community-wide discussions about race, racism, and their co-op to see, to just start talking about how these effects might be, might be playing out in their co-op. So in the end, like, this, a conscious effort is needed to reach beyond what's become the norm for us. Um, in 2009, Peoples was considering a second store, and gentrification was one of the biggest issues that, uh, that kind of like made the idea fade away. Um, and I understand this concern. Um, for people to feel like they belong on a deep level, like that ICA chart, like that orange chart before, um, you have to do a lot of things. Those neighbors um, really have to feel like they belong, and they have to belong. They have to be part of the co-op for there not to be gentrification. Um, and the existing neighbors in that neighborhood um, might not be into maca or chia or raw food crackers. And then what happens? And that was another thing that Peoples battled with. What if we have to change our product selection? And for Peoples, that's a, that's a really big deal. Um, and another thing that they found um, back then was that market studies, so market studies kind of, th there's an inherent issue with market studies. Um, market studies try to find out if you can start the same kind of store in a new neighborhood. So they look for people who are white and middle class and well educated. <laughs> so that's already, you're already just setting yourself up to be the same thing in possibly a completely different neighborhood. Um, so that's something they also found. So co-ops can be a tool to combat, to combat gentrification, but uh, this takes time and building relationships and being open to change. So how can co-ops open doors to participation to a wider variety of people, voices, and experiences? What are the barriers to this at every level? On the retail floor, on the board and on management, on the staff, and for each of us personally? I think that starting this discussion is a way that co-ops can answer the ICA's call to be leaders in social, economic, and environmental issues in a, in a way that we can stay relevant, and relevant to and preferred by people. So I don't know exactly what it's going to look like for peoples, um, but I'm hoping that I, I think our process is, is going to be expansive and inclusive and involve a lot of change for us personally and for the co-op. <laughs>